Are you leaving? Oh, he's coming back with a bottle. She's like, come on. <laughs> come on. Well, this morning, uh, uh, many of the folks who were here yesterday, they already know who you guys are. But would you mind, for the benefit of our, of our audience, just uh, introduce yourselves? Sure. My name is uh, Peter Gurry. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. And... Uh, Went to Bible College in Chicago at Moody Bible Institute, then went on to Dallas Seminary, and then went and did my PhD in England. And somewhere in there, I met my wife at a Christian camp where she grew up and where I grew up going as a camper. And we got married, and we now have four kids with one on the way. So, <laughs> that goes to tell you that you can be a Bible scholar and... and uh, Still have a big family, right? <laughs> All right. Oh my. Well, the guy next to him is not going to let you down either. All right, Dr. Mead. <laughs> yeah, my name is John Mead. I grew up just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in a Christian home. Went to college, actually, at Columbia International University in Columbia, South Carolina. So I picked up y'all in my vocabulary <laughs> there. It pops out every now and again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, met my wife, Annie, there. And we've since had... Uh, four kids. We moved to Louisville, Kentucky for seminary and PhD work, and then uh, on to Phoenix, Arizona in 2012, uh, where I've been teaching Old Testament survey and Hebrew language, Greek language, uh, biblical theology, how do we put the whole Bible together, how do we read the Bible as one book, and, uh, and of course, now I'm a co-director with this guy here, of what we call the Phoenix Seminary Text and Canon Institute, where we are trying to raise the visibility of issues of pertaining to the history of the Bible, as well as uh, trying to set a pretty high academic standard and also try to make a bridge between sound academics and serving the local church with that scholarship. So. Um, Maybe that's too much. Anyways. No, no, that's great. <laughs> By the way, uh, the, did you hear the word, the, na the, the name of the city, Phoenix, yeah. Arizona? Do you guys want to stick around here a little longer? Do you like, <laughs> you like the weather, the foliage? Yep. It's 100 degrees every day. So. We do like the foliage. <laughs> we do. <laughs> now, we're so glad you guys are here today. And then uh, Dr. Black. Dr. Black has been a good friend, a spiritual mentor to me in, in many ways and, and has, been, has been a blessing. Dr. Black, would you mind introducing yourself? <laughs> I'm Dave. I'm a sinner. <laughs> a sinner saved by God's amazing grace. Mm -hmm. For 37 wonderful years, I was married to Becky Lynn until she went home to be with the Lord six years ago. Including DNA and non-DNA kids, I have 10 kids and 19 grandkids, two of whom are in heaven. I, uh, I own and operate Rosewood Farm in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. And I, I teach a little Greek on the side. <laughs> well, uh, just to give you uh, uh, some information, I love the way that guy talks. Um, uh, I got to meet Dr. Mead in the red shirt in the middle. Uh, last year, we were at a conference together at Southeastern Seminary, and we were uh, both listening to the same scholar, and, and it, was, it was very enlightening at the same time, a little frustrating. You're hearing stuff, you go, and that's not, I don't know if I agree with that. I'm, I'm <laughs> typing away, I'm tweeting away, and I look over my phone and I see another guy typing even faster than I was typing. <laughs> and I was like, and every time there would be an issue that I didn't agree with, it would, I, my fingers would start moving and his would move even faster. I said, I need to find out who this guy is. And at the end yeah. of uh, that session, I walked over, shook hands with him, and, and had a chance to meet Dr. Mead. And then he came to uh, our church last summer and taught a class, and it was wonderful. Many of you all had a chance to hear him, and it was a blessing to us. But in that conversation, uh, we didn't realize that we had a mutual friend, which is Dr. Peter Gurry. And, uh, and I've known Dr. Gurry a little longer than Dr. Me. And um, my, my mentor professor, we were at a conference together, and he said, I need to see Peter Gurry. I, I want to make sure I don't miss him. He's supposed to meet with me. And I already knew who he was based on a blog that's known as Evangelical Textual Criticism, mm -hmm. the ETC blog. And um, so I said, I know, I know. And, and finally I had a chance to meet him. And we had, we had late dinner that night. People were trying to get us out of that <laughs> the food court. And we had a wonderful time. And of course, uh, Dr. Black as well. You've seen him here at church several times. Uh, both uh, Dr. Um, uh, Gurry and Dr. Mead have written books. Um, 
uh, Dr. Um, if I can maybe begin with Dr. Gurry, he's written uh, books like this, A New Approach to Textual Criticism. His copies got sold out, so tough luck, people. <laughs> he should have been here. Uh, but it's a great book. Um, I've read it. Introduction to some very cutting edge methods that are coming out on, on creating the text or putting the text together of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And then also, there's a book coming out in uh, just a month called Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism. Uh, Dr. Gurry lent me a free publication copy, and it's, I, I truly believe this is going to be a bestseller. I really believe that. <laughs> I hope you're it right. Has, <laughs> <laughs> you're retired. It has some really uh, important stuff in it and up to date, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then, of course, Dr. Mead uh, has written the Biblical Canon List from Early Christianity. You can see it from this angle, but if you look at the spine, published by University of Oxford Press. And uh, that's not in Ground County. Just want to make sure nobody was <laughs> confused. This is different. This is, different Oxford. Uh, one on the other side of the pond, and um, and of course, uh, uh, what can I say about Dr. Black? Uh, he has <laughs> books. Have you published anything, Dr. Black? <laughs> <laughs> and more books, and I've read pretty much most of them, and have also interviewed him uh, on our radio show and our podcast. So let's begin this, uh, this conversation now. Um, you know, we talk about the Bible, we talk about scholarships, and sometimes people think that if you are a true scholar, if you are a true uh, scholar of the Bible, you cannot have faith. Some people think that. Uh, Dr. Gurry, would you mind sharing with us your view of the text, or how did you grow up and, and <coughs> the love for the text that you have? Sure. So, I, well, I think, first of all, that idea that you can't be a scholar and be a committed Christian is what the British would call rubbish. Um, I don't hold to that view at all. Um, my own background, my own, uh, the way I got into this was um, I was able to take Greek in high school, mainly because I didn't want to take Spanish. That was the only other option it was Spanish or Greek. So I signed up for Greek, not knowing what I was getting into. And four years later, I was headed off to Bible college to do more Greek. And um, I still remember getting my first printed Greek New Testament, like the kind that Dr. Black has in his hand. And it just blew me away that there was this thing behind my English Bible. And so as a little, as an 18 year old high schooler, I was correcting my NIV with what little Greek I knew. <laughs> um, and uh, but I was fascinated there was this thing behind my translation. And then I got to Bible college and realized there were manuscripts behind my printed Greek New Testament. And ever since I've been really fascinated by that process of how do we go from thousands of hand copied manuscripts of the New Testament to a printed edition that then gets used by Bible translators that I then read in my ESV or New King James. And then you went off to Cambridge yep. University, did yep. your PhD work there. Did my PhD over there. Yep. Okay. Dr. Mead, would you mind sharing with us uh, what is the premise foundation from which you look at the Bible? Yeah, <laughs> well, I, again, maybe like most of you in this room, I mean, I grew up in a Christian home and... Uh, we were taught uh, from a young age that this was our authority. I don't know if I ever necessarily learned the word canon, but I realized later that, um, that this is the canon of Scripture, which if it means anything, it means it's your life's authority, okay? So, um, so I learned this not just theoretically, but as some churches in Massachusetts that we were a part of started to drift more and more liberal, uh, doubting the authority of this text. Um, my parents, I think, actively modeled what authority means by moving to churches that would continue to affirm the Bible's own authority and teaching for what to believe and for how to live, okay? So, uh, so I would just say from a young age, uh, without, I think, learning the fancy word canon, um, I was... I was introduced to what it meant to have a canonical text, that is a text that one, uh, or a text that organizes and sets a standard for one's belief and practice. So from there, um, you know, I went on to, to Bible college where I learned uh, how to read the scriptures in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and uh, from that point on realized that there was far more uh, to learn in terms of manuscripts and the Bible's history and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I want to say it's, it's mainly about discipleship, 
right? Mm. Um, this, this young lad up here baptized, um, he would be uh, in the early church, right, a candidate for, for, or a catechumen, a new convert, right? And it's interesting that in that canon list book that Pastor Shaw mentioned, some of those canon lists come out of uh, teaching for new believers, okay? Oh, wow. and, and one of those canon lists written by Cyril of Jerusalem introduces new believers to what books will be their authority, you see, what books they should read in private and which books they will hear read in public church services, okay? So, um, so it's very interesting. Learning about what this is uh, happens, should happen very early on in a new convert's life, okay? And I feel like that happened in some ways for me. Yeah. Dr. Black? Well, I think the original question was, what's the relation between faith and reason? And uh, <clears throat> when I lived what? in Switzerland, I had the privilege of sitting under the feet of a man you may have never heard of. His name's Francis Schaeffer. And Francis Schaeffer was perhaps one of the leading apologists of the 20th century. And you have to remember in Europe, you know, the only people who believe in God are like people don't know better, little children and old people. And he had a ministry to university students, and basically what he said to them is, you don't have to put your brake in park or neutral when you become a Christian. You don't have to make a leap of faith. We have a historically based sound religion called Christianity. So to me, the question is no longer between faith and reason. It's between a reasonable faith and a faithless reason. And that's why we're having conferences like this, to, to, to show us that there is no contradiction between science and the Bible. That's right. You know, uh, many of you have asked me or you know my own PhD research is headed in the direction of a scholar, a professor by the name of Bart Ehrman from right here at UNC mm -hmm. Chapel Hill. You've, you've heard of his book called Misquoting Jesus. I'm going to put up a quote on the screen and, and then have you guys, scholars, respond uh, as to what, what's going on here. He said in his book, Misquoting Jesus, how does it help us to say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God? If, in fact, we do not have the words that God inerrantly inspired, but only the words copied by scribes, sometimes correctly, but sometimes, and he puts in parentheses, many times incorrectly. What he's saying is that the Bible we have, how do we even know this is truly the inerrant word of God if there are tons of mistakes because the scribes have you know, fumbled everything. Uh, maybe Dr. Mead, you want to pick us <laughs> off being Old Testament and talk about that first? Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Ehrman is almost certainly talking about the New Testament here, um, but I, I, think, I think my answer would be the same. Uh, one, he's very confident that we don't have those original words, right, in order to make a comparison, right? So he has a phantom text out here, uh, or at least he's telling us it's a phantom text, uh, and yet he seems to know quite a bit about it because he knows for certain that we don't have it, okay, right? So, so we need to be very careful in how we're understanding his, his prose here. Um, but I, I guess I would just say, if we're just, just talking about the evidence for the text of the Old Testament, I think we can talk about, um, not in all cases, of course, but in a great number of cases of early manuscripts, which we went into yesterday in some detail, there's one. Uh, what we can talk about is, um, is, is, a, is a fairly certain, secured wording across manuscripts dated from 150 BC, okay, like on the screen behind me, and, and that same text, okay, also appearing in our later manuscripts from 1000 AD, okay? So we can talk about a conservative copying of the text, right? All written, all handwritten, right? But, but nonetheless, a conservative copying of the text uh, across a 1,000-year period, okay? That spans the, the main part of our evidence. So I hope that makes sense. This little image behind me, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually some writing down the margin. What happened is the original scribe around 150 B.C., uh, made a, an error of sight. His, his eye skipped. There's a text that repeats there in Isaiah 40, verses 7 and 8. His eye skipped, verse 7, and he started to copy the second instance in verse 8. 
But what's fascinating about this is that instead of destroying the manuscript, the same scribe caught the mistake and actually included the missing text right down the side of, of, of the text there. I don't know if that's clear. But um, that just shows me that uh, Hebrew scribes really cared about accuracy in copying. You see, they made a mistake, that's clear, but they also caught the mistake and included the missing text down the side. So, you know, we could multiply examples of this, and it just kind of, it should, I think, um, instill a, a, a bit more trust, you see, in the hand copying. Dr. Ehrman has a very pessimistic view of hand copying, and that's, he's right to say that. There are many errors in our manuscripts, but um, we have many examples that show scribes were also trying to be very careful in copying the words that were in manuscripts, you know, in front of them and that kind of thing. So. What, is, what was the role of the temple uh, in, in the lives of the Jewish people? Yeah, so, um, so I was going to actually just cite very quickly 2 Kings uh, verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 8, where uh, then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, right? And, of course, the house of the Lord is the temple. And uh, don't be surprised by this, because in all ancient Near Eastern cultures, like the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, the Egyptians, all of their uh, political and religious texts are stored in the temple or the shrine. And Israel is no exception. They found this very significant document, the book of the law, in the temple. But what the temple then also does is we know that's the place where the copying of those documents took place, okay? And also the, the main hub, so to speak, or dis, of dissemination of those texts to other religious sites, okay? So it creates a controlled environment for, for the copying and preserving of the Old Testament text, okay? And it would take quite a while to pl uh, flush that out, but, but that's basically... I think where Pastor Shaw is going with that. Right. Dr. Yeah. Gurry, with the regards to the New Testament. Sure. So with regard to the New Testament, I think um, it can be tempting to think of the copying of the New Testament a bit like the telephone game, where kind of the whole, whole point of the game is to be funny and to <laughs> have a good time. So you say something to the first person, they pass it along to the next person, it goes to the next person, and on and on. And by the time you get to the end, it makes no sense. Uh, some people kind of think of that, but if you look at this, this manuscript, the same thing is going on here that we just saw in the Hebrew manuscript, which is on the, on the left side, you have a correction from the scribe. This is Mark chapter 1 in a medieval manuscript, and this is a manuscript I looked at in Florence, Italy. It's a complete New Testament, and all through this manuscript, you see marginal notes like this. And in fact, what they are is they're marginal corrections. Mm -hmm. Because the scribe of this manuscript was not a great first-time copyist, but he was a pretty good corrector. He went through the whole thing and checked it, and he found a bunch of places where he left things out by accident. And then he went back and added them back in in the margin. And what this shows us is that, yes, scribes did make mistakes. Yep. Some of them, this guy made a lot. But they could also correct their own mistakes as well. So it's not quite like the telephone game because you don't usually correct the message in telephone. Right. The whole point is to kind of have to get it wrong. <laughs> that's right. No, that's, ex I mean, that's exactly that's kind right. of why it's a game, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. so both the Old Testament and New Testament. Dr. Black, what do you? What would you well, say? I was just going to say, Dr. Ehrman found like 400,000 variant readings in the New Testament manuscripts. There, he lost his faith. Well, how can I trust the Bible that has 400,000 mistakes? I'm holding in my non-nicotine stained hands a copy of the New Testament <clears throat> in Greek. This is the Word of God. Amen? Amen? This is the Word of God. And as I pointed out in the first service, I hate to repeat myself, we haven't lost a single word of the Greek New Testament, okay? I'm just not sure whether the original is printed above the line or below the line. Above the line is the text, and below the line are the textual variants. For example, we're in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Some manuscripts say, and and he gave gifts to men. Others just have, he gave gifts to men. Those are called textual variants. But the fact of the matter is, my beloved, we have not lost a single word of the New Testament. In fact, we have 104% of the New Testament. I'm just not always sure whether the original reading, and Peter and I often disagree on which the original <laughs> reading is, it doesn't really matter. Whether you think it's written above the line or below the line, we have the Word of God. And may I also point out, like I said in the first service, if you, hold up your, if you hold up your New King James Bible, it is also the Word of God. This is the Word of God. Now, 
There's a little footnote that you might want to add. This is the Word of God to the degree that it accurately reflects the original languages. But you don't have to say that. You don't have to mention that. That's just assumed, correct? But it is the Word of God. We have not lost the Word of God. God has providentially preserved to His church through 2,000 years yeah, right. or longer yeah. <laughs> the Word of God. Yeah, that's right. You know, you, you hear uh, journalists like uh, Kurt Eichenwald for Newsweek magazine, and again, he's published a lot of articles some very uh, famous articles if you, if you keep up with uh, mm -hmm. politics and news like that. But then he decided to write on, on uh, the Bible stuff. And here's what his quote, which has uh, been repeated repeatedly. Uh, no television <laughs> preacher has ever read the Bible. Now, I could probably agree with many of the television preachers I've seen. But um, <laughs> at best, we've That's all read so a bad translation. A translation of translations, of translations of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies, and on and on, hundreds of times. Now, unfortunately, wouldn't you guys agree that many times a, a, an unsuspecting layperson sees that in a magazine? Oh, that cannot be wrong. How could they put something, you know, wrong in a magazine? Or, of course, if everything's on, if it's on the internet, it's correct, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Dr. Google. Yes. Uh, yeah, Google is, is no. we, we're being sarcastic. <laughs> I, I know Dr. Black already began that, that, that talk on, on translations. Would you mind sharing, I mean, how, how do we see that? So the, the part about translations kind of goes back to that idea of the telephone game, which we, we already addressed a little bit. But I do think um, it can be, some people can think, well, we, our translations really obscure more than they reveal of the original. And I want to make a plea that the original languages are extremely valuable to learn. I remember actually it was Hebrew. It was reading the book of Jonah in Hebrew that really solidified my love for reading the scripture in the original because there's so many wonderful word plays and other things that are just difficult to bring out in translation well. Uh, but you pick up any modern, um, particularly the more literal type English translations, and they're all very good. So I often say it's not a choice between good or bad translations, it's a choice often between good and good, right? Uh, in some cases, good or better, but they're all very good, and we should be really thankful that we have such good English translations. Absolutely. Dr. Mead? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I'm, I'll, I'll leave the translations aside, but just to go back and reiterate, um, this rhetoric of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies and on and on hundreds of times, Again, this is, this is to um, try to sensationalize the manuscript process, and it's also, again, an attempt to show that there was no controls whatsoever, okay? And it's also trying to tell a narrative that based on the manuscripts that we have in our possession of Old or New Testament, it's trying to tell a story of textual chaos, okay? Uh, and yet, those of us who, who actually look at these things, we recognize there are problems, but there's not, there's not this complete chaos to the point where you can say no one has ever read the Bible. Okay. Right. It also goes back to this issue of how does he know? Right. How does he know no one has ever read the Bible? Right. Does he know what the Bible looks yes. like that he knows no one else has ever read? <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. This doesn't even work logically. Yeah, he would have, he would have to have seen that thing. He would have to have seen it, that's, and I'd like that to know he where said he saw no, it. That no one has ever read. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. Yeah. So yeah. But statements yeah. like this get made, and, and sometimes, and it's sad, it shouldn't happen that way, but in, sometimes in university, secular university settings, statements are made just to jar the faith of a young person. And I know many of y'all have come to me and said, would you please talk to my son or daughter? And I see some faces here uh, because they went to so-and-so university, came back, and now they question everything because, you know, they, their eyes have been opened because their professor told them, right. you know, the, the grandma's faith is so out of date, it's so out of touch because now we have facts of how the Bible has right. been corrupted beyond repair. Right. Old Testament, New Testament, Dr. Right. Me. Yeah, I just want to add to that, too, because I, I think what's happened is, and something that I think this conference was trying to do and, and something that we all have tried to do in our ministries, uh, when we talk about where the Bible came from, we're, we're trying to, 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 to chart a course here between um, the Bible fell out of heaven on a sheet. Right. Okay. Um, Again, as a child uh, in the faith, 
That's, that's kind of what I believed. I, I thought my NIV at the time had fallen out of heaven on a sheet. I didn't know about the languages it was written in. I didn't know about the manuscripts that it was written in. Um, and, and so the first time I'm confronted with languages and manuscripts, I'm kind of jarred a little bit. Okay. But the whole sheet approach is more of a Islamic approach towards yes, the Quran. Yes, absolutely, not what we absolutely. As Christians believe, right? Never so, have. so, so that's one cor one correction conferences like this is trying to make. The, the Bible didn't fall out of heaven on a sheet. That's not what happened. The second, on the other side, is for statements like this to say, "Oh, well, there's all there's textual randomness and chaos. No one's ever had a word from God ever at any time." and say, well, no, that's not right either. When we look at the evidence, neither this, this is not true and this is also not true, right. right? So we're trying to just correct some extremes on both sides, admit there are issues, there are problems, but there is also clearly discernible divine providence in what gives us the word of, or what has preserved the word of God for us today, I, I would say, yeah. And it makes a difference because what we have, sometimes you don't hear the other side, which is that we have reputable scholars from reputable universities, just like these three gentlemen here, uh, who have examined manuscripts, who have looked at them very carefully. In fact, there's a video I want to show you that helps you understand that Christian scholars are not second class. <laughs> they, they are right up there, shoulder to shoulder. At times, they are uh, shoulders above what's happening elsewhere. So uh, let's check out this video. Ritual unwrapping begins by acquiring a three-dimensional volumetric scan of the damaged manuscript. This scan produces a set of cross-sectional images that show the internal structure of the scroll. When viewed as a 3D object, one can clearly see the individual layers of the scroll, but any text on the surface of those layers is obscured from view. In order for a readable version of the scroll to be produced, these images must be passed through our virtual unwrapping pipeline. First, we capture the 3D shape of the layers of the scroll in a process called segmentation. On the left side of the screen, the software moves through the scroll, image by image, tracing the shape of a single scroll wrap. On the right, we see the 3D model that this produces. Next, we extract the ink from the data in a process called texturing. Using the 3D shape generated by segmentation, our software makes another pass through the scroll, this time looking for very bright pixels. Bright pixels indicate regions of dense material, in this case, inks made with iron or lead. We now have a single wrap of the scroll with the text shown clearly on its surface. However, because the surface is curved, it's difficult to read all of the text from one viewpoint. The flattening stage of our pipeline converts this textured 3D surface into a flat plane so that the text can be more easily read. To produce the best results, these three steps must be performed on one small section of the scroll at a time. As a result, we end up with several texture images that must be merged together. This merging process creates a single consolidated image that shows the full text. Using this pipeline, we have restored and revealed the text of five complete wraps of the En Gedi scroll. The two distinct columns of Hebrew writing reveal the scroll to be the Book of Leviticus. This marks the En Gedi scroll as the earliest copy of a Pentateuchal book ever found in a holy ark, a significant discovery in biblical archaeology. Yeah. Wow. You know, Pretty sometimes cool. we, we, we don't realize the, the amount of research that is being mm. done to make sure we get to those, that, those original words of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament. And... and yeah, totally. Guys, uh, Dr. Black, what would you like to share about that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Video said it all. Yeah, you know, it's just, yeah. The canon. Now, let's talk about the canon for a moment. Yeah. Um, Dr. Mead, you've done a lot of work on that <laughs> part. Uh, we found this gospel that's not one of the four gospels. And uh, what should we do now? I mean, should we, should we read? I'm not talking more about the New Testament. Or how about those other books in the Old Testament that we don't include in our Old Testament canon of 39 books? Are we missing out? What's happening here? I mean, is the church trying to hide something? Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, how many of y'all have heard that kind of... Yeah, a few yeah. of you. Yeah? What do we do with this? We've all read Dan Brown, maybe. Uh, of course. The Da Vinci yeah. Code. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, 
So really, I, I, it's funny, I have to use this word secret, which is unfortunate, but, but it should be no secret, right, that there are uh, known now a hand, more than a handful of other Gospels, so-called, that did not make it into our New Testaments. And so some have wondered, yeah, were early Christians hiding them? Were, were they not reading them? Were they burning them? You know, all kinds of theories are out there uh, for why Christians, uh, or for why we don't have those books in our Bibles today. The fact of the matter is early Christians were well aware of these books, and they were also well aware that they were newer compositions, they were newer books than their older four Gospels, okay? So, so they read them, they studied them, they refuted much of the uh, uh, heresy, right? Or, or, yeah, heresy in those books. Um, so if a new Gospel were discovered today, which uh, <laughs> some Harvard professor thought there was one now, right? This Gospel of Jesus' wife turned out to be a forgery, a modern forgery. So they were, someone uh, was trying to say, hey, there was another gospel out there. You know, it was, it was a Florida man. Yeah, no, the whole, the Atlantic, was story. it the Atlantic that, tra that traced the whole yeah. story? Yeah, uh, it was actually, a, yeah, a man in Florida who found a way to <laughs> transcribe this Coptic writing uh, on an old piece of papyrus and trying to sell it on the antiquities market as one of the lost gospels. Okay, so we have to be really careful, right? There's a lot of misinformation and people out there trying to misguide and deceive, okay, in this area. Uh, so, and the deception was so good that it deceived one of Harvard's uh, early Christianity professors, okay, and uh, then this, this can happen. So, so to answer your question real quickly, if a, if a gospel is discovered today, uh, it's never going to make it into the canon of Christ's church because this has already been long decided, okay? I, I would just argue one, maybe one last point, and that is these gospels can give us maybe some insights into what some Christians thought about Jesus, okay? Uh, this, this actually does a disservice to these later, these early Gospels, but here's a modern example. Uh, how many of you have heard of the book of the, they're called The Shack? Yeah, that's good, good. You got some hands going. Well, well, that's the experience of someone, right? The religious experience of someone uh, and, and, and her relationship with God, right? Okay. Uh, we wouldn't argue that this is inspired or in the canon or anything like that, just like we wouldn't argue these earlier uh, gospels weren't in the canon, or would be, should be in the canon either. But what it does is it represents someone's experience with God or Jesus, uh, very personal, not meant for the entire church universal, okay? Can I maybe it put it? may not be a good experience. No, no, no. And, and it <laughs> okay. may contain right. lots of error <laughs> in terms of theology right. and doctrine, absolutely. Right. Uh, oftentimes it does, okay, uh, contain... Uh, heterodox teaching. Sorry, that was a How long answer. How about you, Dr. Zurich? <clears throat> what do you want me to say? About, about the canon? About the canon. Uh, me as the expert on canon, I would just say yes. <laughs> 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 I'm just here for the ride. Um, no, just, yeah, same thing. Uh, one of the things I always encourage students to do when you hear about these non-canonical gospels, so the gospel of Thomas, gospel of Judas was big right. uh, about 10 years ago maybe, uh, is read them. If you, if you mm -hmm. Google Gospel of Thomas, you'll yeah, find an English translation, read it, you will immediately see why it was not included. Right. I mean, really, no, that's true. all you need no. to do. Yeah. You don't need to be yeah. kind of afraid of them in the sense of don't read these, go read them and you'll know exactly why right. the right. early Christians did not include them. That's right. And how about the Old Testament? I know there are some questions about some of those books. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is, this is probably a bit closer to the, to the crux. Uh, books like Wisdom of Solomon, jo Judith, Tobit, 1st, 2nd Maccabees, uh, Ecclesiasticus, uh, or the book of Ben Sira, uh, same book. Um, yeah, how come we don't have those books in our Bibles, right? That's, that's a huge question, uh, one that I spent an hour and 15 minutes trying to answer here at Clearview last summer. So, uh, but, but real quick, um, if you look at the canon list book out there on the table, you will notice that out of the out of all the Old Testament lists, in, written in Greek originally, again, we translate all those lists so you can see them, but no Greek, no early Greek canon list contains those books in the canon, OK? 
okay? That was shocking to me. I thought that early Christians had those books in the canon, but when I actually went and looked at the canon list, I realized those books were not authoritative for doctrine, okay? What happens is uh, that debate, some, some folks like St. Augustine thought those books were in the canon, okay? And so there was a debate amongst the Western churches whether they should have those books in. Jerome said no, and he's, apparent, he's definitely with the earliest tradition. Augustine said, yes, we should include them because we're reading them now, and they're helpful to our faith now, and so they should be in our canon. Fast forward all the way to the 16th century, 1500s, and what happens is the Reformation ultimately sides with Jerome which ends up, again, attaching the Reformation tradition to the earliest tradition for not including those six books, Mm -hmm. okay? The Catholic Church with the Council of Trent ultimately winds up with the Augustine tradition with including those books in the canon. So in a really brief history there, you can kind of see how the two streams have developed. But I will say this, early Protestants originally printed those books in their Bibles. They were not included in the Old Testament or the New. They were included in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And something like uh, Martin Luther's German translation from 1534 had a preface before those apocryphal books, and they said, all, and it said, although these books are not equal to Scripture, nevertheless, they are good and useful to read. Okay. And that was a very early Protestant position on those books. It wasn't until the 1600s, well after the first printing of the King James Version, that those books stopped being printed okay, in English versions. So um, I, I don't have time to go into all the examples, but there are many good things to pull out of those books, things that mm-hmm. I think would, uh, would strengthen the faith of some of us here, for sure. Dr. Black? Read the New Testament. Amen. Amen. How many, how many <laughs> gospels are there? <laughs> one. I love this. Yes. Sure. One. And Paul in Galatians says that gospel must be kept pure at any cost. If anybody brings to you another gospel, whether it's an angel from heaven or me, get as far away from that person as possible because God is about to judge them. There's one gospel. That's why the earliest church didn't talk about the four gospels. They talked about the fourfold gospel. And in fact, I am beginning to repent of language I've used all of my life, gospel of Matthew, gospel of Mark. That's, the early church never referred to them that way. There's one gospel, kata Matthion, kata Markon, kata Lukon, kata Ioannin. One gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. So the question is, why do we have four versions of the same account? That's a really important question, and I think there are historical reasons for that. And that's why one of the books on the table is one book that I've entitled, Why Four Gospels? The historical origins of the Gospels. There are historical reasons for that, but I think it's important to realize there's only one Gospel. It's the fourfold, not the fivefold, right. not the sixfold, the fourfold Gospel. Unfortunately, our time is running away, so I'm going I'm to shift gears uh, for the last minute or two. You know, when you are studying the manuscripts or textual variants uh, and all those little pesky details up close like that, how does that affect your faith? I mean, what do you have to do to keep that, you know, your spiritual life alive? Dr. Gurry? Um. Well, I didn't, I didn't become a Christian because of what I knew about manuscripts. <laughs> uh, I became a Christian because I was a sinner in need of salvation, and that's still the reason why I'm a Christian. So uh, I studied the manuscripts for a whole host of reasons, one of which is because I want to know what the New Testament says in places where there are differences. Um, one reason, though, I do it is because it puts me in touch with Christians who've gone before me, and I always remind my students that every manuscript I look at at some point was someone else's Bible. And it's, it's, it was more than likely a copy that they used to, to read and understand what God had, has said to us in his word and expects of us and what it says about Jesus Christ. And so uh, it puts me in touch with those who've gone before me. Absolutely. 
Dr. Me? Yeah, I would just piggyback on that and just say um, uh, the study that I do uh, in many ways strengthens faith. Um, I don't see uh, my historical work as somehow compartmentalized from, from my faith. Um, that was one approach in the 20th century uh, that's led to uh, the death of, of many churches uh, and denominations. Uh, but no, I, I think the, the old slogan, going back at least as far as Augustine, clearly seen in St. Anselm, is an expression, uh, fides quarens intellectum, faith-seeking understanding. Okay. And, uh, and several, I don't know, long, long time ago, I learned this expression, I learned how it was used, and that's been kind of my motto as I approach scholarship. I'm a believer but I'm seeking understanding in these manuscripts, in, in learning more about the history of the church, the history of the Bible. Uh, these things are not at odds with each other. But the order of them is very important, faith-seeking understanding, not the other way around, okay? So um, anyways, maybe that's all I'll say on that. Dr. Black? I've taught pastors in South Korea six times. There's one Korean Bible. I've taught pastors deep underground in China 13 times, there's one Chinese Bible. I've taught pastors in Ukraine three times, there's one Russian Bible. You come to America, a proliferation, an avalanche. And sometimes we think that's good, but I think that could be dangerous. I think it could be upsetting to some of us because we look at all the different translations and they're all different from each other, so like which one is accurate? So to put a little shameless plug in here, why don't, we, why don't we all study the original language and, there, and therefore we, we can begin to adjudicate the accuracy of our Bible translations and maybe begin to wean ourselves from our sometimes over slavish dependence upon the commentaries and the experts and just do it yourself. So, you know, I've taught, Greek, I've taught New Testament Greek in my local church many times. In fact, one of my books called The Jesus Paradigm has an appendix called Returning Biblical Education to Where? the local church. That's where it needs to be done. And Abidan and I have been talking about this, but maybe in the future, maybe we'll do a Greek class. I, you know, be great. We meet every, maybe Monday night for nine months, and after nine months, my guarantee for you is you'll be able to read your Greek New Testament with the minimal use of a dictionary. Just think about that. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> and to have such a top-line scholar as Dr. Black here, we'll take you up on that. Are there going to be any tests, exams? I'm All sure week. they're asking that question. Quizzes and exams every week. <laughs> Every week. Every week. <laughs> well, my wife has asked awesome. a question for these two guys right here. What do you, what do your kids, what do your kids think you do? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. um, what no. do they think we do? No. Tell them about your stuffed animals. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I was, uh, actually, I did before that story. I, um, I, yeah, getting ready to come here uh, on Wednesday night, my kids were like, well, why are you traveling more? Because I'd just gone to Oxford, England, and now Which I'm Which he here. was in yeah. Oxford two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so, so they were wondering, what, what, what are you doing? And, and my, my kids are still trying to figure out the faith, and, you know, I don't know if I'm the best guide, but we're trying. It's life, you know. And, uh, but but I'm, I'm telling them, you know, that, that this church wants uh, Mr. Gurry and I to come out to help, you know, explain the history of the Bible, like where it came from. And my 10-year-old kind of actually understood that sentence, and she goes, well, that's good, I guess, you know. And so, <laughs> yeah, so I thought, okay, well, we could just end it there, I guess. Uh, but, 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 you know, they were, my kids are going to be really messed up because I, I talk about very obscure elements of the history of the Bible around them, and uh, they start to name their stuffed animals uh, with names like, Aquila and Symmachus and Theodosian. <laughs> I think one of them is named Origen, actually. So, you know, I just, I, if, I, I don't know, we miss Fluffy somewhere. Fluffy's not amongst the stuffed animals, so. <laughs> uh, we're so, so glad you guys left your families and came this way. And, and what, wait a minute, why didn't you ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Black. Is this age discrimination? No, no, no. no. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Growing up, my kids never knew what I did, because when I was home, I was home. Did all of my writing, all of my scholarship at school. So 
He, Jim Elliott, the martyred Alka Indian missionary, said, said it this way, wherever you are, be all there, yeah, and live true. to the hilt whatever you are convinced is the will of God for your life. I think kids need their dads when yeah. the dads are at home. That's true. Give them a big hand of applause. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mm-hmm.